Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for today is the Gospel reading, read just a few moments ago, Mark chapter 10, verses 2 through 16. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I once heard another preacher refer to this text as a text of terror. Indeed, when we read it, you can almost feel the tension in the air, and you can hear the squirming in the pews, and that's true for preachers as well. We, too, find that these words make us squirm. But there is a great amount of truth in these words that goes unmined by so many of us. We hear the words on the surface, and that's where we stay. We don't apply them to our own hearts, but we're very quick to apply them to everyone else. And so, while I would have preferred to preach on Genesis, I must preach on the gospel. It leaves too many questions, too many loose ends. So, you got me, God. In our text for today, we note first off that the Pharisees come. And that immediately sets our radar off that we know that this is no simple little question, is it? No, they come either to justify themselves, definitely to test Jesus, and really, not really to ask questions about marriage and divorce, but to test the law. Will Jesus uphold the law of Moses? Remember, the law was everything to a Pharisee. And so, Jesus, knowing his audience, says, What did Moses command you? We're given a little bit of a better understanding of their question when we look to Matthew chapter 19, where the question is quoted as, Is it lawful for a man, lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause? Yeah. And therein lay the problem. There was a lot of male ego and desire going on here. A lot of who's in charge and who's not. A woman in a divorce would lose everything. She would lose her income. She would lose her reputation. She would lose her ability for just about anything. And so the law of Moses was written to protect the weak and the vulnerable. Go back to Deuteronomy 24. That's where you will find that law. Jesus says, what did Moses command you? And they said, he allowed it. Just write it and send her away. And Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment. And there is the crux of the entire matter. The hardness of heart. We often hear of the elderly and hardening of the arteries. The hardening of the heart is something that comes because of sin. And sin continues to put this crust over our hearts. And we, in order to protect ourselves, build up walls around our hearts. And so very often we end up treating everyone else as insignificant. There is little regard for life or for the lives of others. Many of the rabbis, and they all debated this question, but many of them were extremely liberal in their understanding of how a man could do this to a woman. She doesn't please you anymore. Well, what does that mean? She burns your toast this morning? Well, basically just about anything went in the eyes of some rabbis. And so Jesus says, the hardness of your heart it is what has brought this around. He also recognizes that because we are frail and flawed human beings, because our hearts are never completely and totally soaked up and purely the love of God, there is that struggle between saint and sinner every day of our redeemed life. Because of that, there are some times when hurts are so deep that we don't get over them. When trust is broken, sometimes it's hard to ever trust again anybody, but especially the person who broke that trust, who ripped this relationship apart. 
You see, that's what the hardness of heart does. Remember Pharaoh? Actually, all of his host who drove the Israelites to labor and labor and labor. Pharaoh, who would not let the people go. Pharaoh, who then pursued after them. We're told it was the hardness of heart. And sometimes there comes a point in life where people become so hard of heart and so refusing of God, so self-absorbed and ignoring of everyone else, that God says, have it your way. And that man's lot is then a terrible lot because he is left standing before the Lord only in judgment. And we're reminded in the book of Hebrews that it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Indeed, our God is a consuming fire. But we also know him, don't we, in the face of Jesus. We also know him by the promises made from Genesis 3 on through that he would never, ever leave nor abandon us. The truth of the matter is that because there is sin and it's handed down from generation to generation, sorry kids, we had nothing better to give you but a sinful life. We also live that out on our own, don't we? We make our own decisions. We try to play God in our own lives to the exclusion of God until he's a last resort. That kind of carefree life is really a care-filled life, one ridden with pain and misery, but so often we absolutely refuse to see it. What Jesus is talking about here is the Creator's intent. Okay, that's what Moses did after the fall because of your hard hearts. But what did the Creator intend? And Jesus takes them back to creation, to the very beginning, when there was harmony between God and man and woman, between humanity, God, and all the creatures of the earth. He takes them back to that blissful Eden and reminds them what God intended marriage to be and therefore what it should be for his children. It should be a relationship filled with the very love of God. And for you and me as Christians, it means filled with the forgiveness that only God can give. We are never going to be free from a little bit of hardness of heart. We are never going to be perfect at living out a relationship of love. We are going to stumble somewhere. And we're going to be tested by something. And as I tell so many of my premarital couples, sorry folks, you have blissful ideas now, and that's good. Keep those goals. But remember, you cannot put two sinners together in a relationship and expect that it's going to be perfect. It never will be. That's why we have the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus purifies us from all our sins. The blood of Jesus reestablishes that relationship between us and the Heavenly Father, it reestablishes for us in Christ the community of love that God desires for all to experience. Brokenness is all around us. And rather than using these words as we so often have to point at others, they are intended first and foremost, as all of Scripture is, to be introspective. To read these words and look into our own hearts, even if we're in a perfect marriage or had a perfect marriage, even if we're not married, to look into our own hearts and say, what are the relationships like in my life? Have I discarded and discounted individuals? Have I kicked them to the curb? Have I focused only on myself and my own needs? And every one of us should be able, in the end of that, to know that we have a lot to bring to the foot of the cross. And that is where we must bring it. You see, our God is the God who invites us to bring all of that brokenness to him so that he can make something new and beautiful. 
He does not say, once you get it right, you can come to me and I'm going to bless you. No, instead, when brokenness first occurred and ever since that date, he has continued to pursue, to come to us and to pursue us to reestablish that relationship lost and to give us not only the hope of living in peace with one another here in this world, but for certain, without any strife or chaos in the world to come. It is interesting that we go from the vulnerable woman who had no rights at the time of Jesus, even though that is not the way God created it and intended it to be, that we go from that woman to children, the most vulnerable among us. Whenever there is war, whenever there is strife of any kind, whether it is world conflict or within a marriage, within friendships even, the children are always the ones who end up getting hurt the most. God sent his son to reach out, to reach out to children of every age, to reach out to sin children, sinful children, you and me. That little one that we would like to believe is so pure and innocent until they throw a tantrum because they want their own way. And then, too, we must see in their behaviors our own sinful tendencies. The text that is before us may indeed strike terror in the hearts of many, but it need not, because it is to lead us to Christ, where all things are made whole. And in Christ, there is absolutely no sin, save for the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, no sin that is unforgivable. Perhaps somewhere in your life, a relationship went south. Maybe you were totally a victim, although we're always involved in it somehow, aren't we? Maybe you're the one who caused the strife. Look back on that and know that it is from that that God redeems you. It is in the midst of our struggles, in the midst of the bloodiness of life, that our Lord's arms are stretched out on that cross, offering himself up in sacrifice to receive the blessings of heaven and distribute them to you and to me and to all who are not worthy of the Lord's love nor mercy. You see, that's what makes it mercy. We're never worthy of it. It's given in spite of us and totally for the blessing of us because of the heart of the giver, the Lord of all creation. As we look at this text, we must be reminded that this community is to be a gathering together of broken people, broken people whom the Lord loves from the bottom of his heart and with all of his life, and with every drop of the Son's blood. Broken people, loved and brought together, not in perfection, but in his care, to care for one another, to encourage one another, to speak those reminders of Christ's victory over sin, death, and the devil. That victory is yours and mine now. And I know you may say, but pastor, look all around us. There's strife everywhere. And look, my marriage still fell apart. And such and would move on and on and on and on. Yet did you listen to the epistle reading which stated a great truth? At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. It does not mean that his victory for you has not been won. It means that we're still traveling the path and the pilgrimage of this life. And while we're here, there's going to be pain and trouble. But we do not walk it alone. We have a forgiving and loving Lord who accompanies us every step of the way. And he gives us the gift of one another in all of our frailty and faultiness to encourage each other and to work together 
and to love one another as fellow sinners deeply loved by God. That victory is yours, and it is yours now. And as you feel broken, as you feel the need to come to the cross, thank goodness, know that every other soul in the world is also broken. And the love that he has given to you by making you his own child and placing his name upon you in the waters of baptism, that that love that he has for all of the world is meant for you and it is meant for all. We sometimes have cavalier attitudes and ways that disregard life and relationships. But God says his relationship with you is the absolutely most important thing to him. And he has done everything to provide that. Sometimes it seems just too simple, doesn't it? And yet, because we are sinners, it can seem so difficult. Know that the Lord never, ever gives up on any one of us. And that the healing that we seek will come. Sometimes we see it in this world, and sometimes only in the life to come. But when you belong to him, there is peace always. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.